morning and welcome to this morning's session. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce Professor John Rogers, who is a Lee J. Flory Founder Chair in Engineering uh, and faculty of the Department of Materials Science and Engineering at the University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. John's research achievements include, includes fundamental and applied aspects of nano and molecular scale fabrication, as well as materials and patterning techniques for unusual electronic and uh, photonic devices. He emphasizes bio-integrated and bio-inspired systems. He's published more than 300 papers and is also a prolific inventor with over 80 patents and patent applications. I understand 50 of these are licensed or being actively used by companies. He currently serves as a director of an NSF-sponsored nanoscale science and engineering center on nano manufacturing. John received both a BA and a BS in physics and in chemistry from the University of Texas Austin in 1989. He then received a master's in physics and chemistry in 1992 from MIT, where he also received his PhD in physical chemistry in 1995. Following his studies, John was a junior fellow at the Harvard University Society of Fellows and also director of Active Impulse Systems. The latter is a startup company based on his PhD research that he co-founded in 1995 and was later purchased by a large firm. He was also a part of the Bell Labs Condensed Matter Physics Research Department before coming back to academia. His research has been recognized with many awards, of which I'll highlight just a few of the recent ones. He's a recipient of the Lemelson MIT Prize. He's a MacArthur Fellow and an IEEE George Smith awardee, a National Security Science and Engineering Faculty Fellow of the Department of Defense, and he also received the Leo Hendrick Backlund Award from the American Chemical Society. John is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a fellow of many societies, including the IEEE, American Physical Society, Materials Research Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. We're delighted to have him speak here, and let's give him a warm welcome. All right, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, and to have a chance to talk to you about some of the research that we've been doing at Illinois in sort of bioengineering and in particular in development efforts in, around materials, um, mechanics, and, and manufacturing approaches for what we're calling bio-integrated uh, electronics. And so what I'll do in this talk is to try to motivate uh, why one would be interested in this class of technology, uh, put it in perspective with more conventional uh, electronic systems, and then very quickly step you through uh, a number are pretty simple ideas in, in material science, in, in mechanical engineering, and in assembly or uh, manufacturing that allows us to do some pretty uh, sophisticated things in this space. Uh, and then the last half of the talk will uh, provide a few uh, specific examples of, of uh, where we think uh, you know, we can make a contribution in, in bioengineering and human health uh, in general. So to start, let me just um, remind you of the dominant trend in electronics, and it's one that's uh, persisted from the very early days uh, of the industry in which uh, the number of transistors uh, per processor is doubling about every 18 months. That's Moore's Law. Everyone here uh, is well aware of that. Uh, and that's been a driver for uh, improving the levels of functionality, decreasing the cost, expanding the range of use of electronics in to almost every aspect of our, uh, our daily lives. Uh, and if you think about the research challenges uh, in this kind of development trend, they're all around uh, you know, questions of how do you make transistors uh, smaller and smaller uh, and the associated benefits with reduced dimension in terms of uh, operating speed, uh, density of uh, switching elements, and uh, uh, operating voltages. And so if you talk to people in material science like myself who are interested in electronic materials, uh, those who are working on circuit technologies are uh, in large part focusing on addressing those kinds of problems to allow this kind of continued scaling in uh, functionality according to this uh, Moore's Law. So that's a compelling direction for research and it will remain an active one for years to come. Um, that's not the problem we're interested in. We're interested in one that's maybe a little less well appreciated, which is the fact that if you want high performance electronics, uh, you're stuck with this substrate, uh, the silicon uh, wafer, uh, which is a wonderful class of material for electronics. It's a wonderful format for integrated circuits because it's highly compatible with the kind of uh, optical approaches that are used to pattern the, the circuit elements. But if you think about that platform, it has associated with it also some important 
engineering design constraints uh, for certain things that you might want to do with electronics. Um, for example, the wafer is relatively small. It's perfectly planar. Uh, it's brittle uh, and rigid. Uh, if you try to bend it, it will shatter. You cannot stretch it. The modulus is too high. The fracture strain is only about 1%. And so if you think about those geometrical and mechanical constraints, they represent an alternative set of problems, different than those that are being addressed to uh, continue this kind of Moore's Law scaling uh, of feature sizes that could be interesting as well uh, as research topics because they have the potential, if you can avoid those constraints, to open up entirely new classes of electronic applications that cannot be addressed when you're stuck with this kind of platform. And so you can Im imagine many such applications. We've been focused on two uh, areas of envisioned use. One is in this class of technology that we're referring to as bio-integrated electronics, where you develop high-quality integrated circuits with geometries, mechanics, and forms that perfectly match biology, uh, which is totally different than what you can achieve with a silicon wafer. So skin-like electronics that could laminate directly onto the epidermis to provide advanced function in in uh, healthcare, uh, wellness monitoring, for example, therapeutics, advanced uh, wound care, treatment systems, or internal organs in the body as well. Wrap circuits around the brain, for example. If you're interested in neuroscience or surgical procedures applied to the brain, devices of that type could yield new classes of information that could be used to uh, advantage. So bio-integrated is one class of application you can imagine if you are able to divorce electronics from the rigid silicon wafer platforms that they exist on today. The other is in bio-inspired device design. And so the idea there is that evolution uh, has come up with solutions to lots of very difficult problems in technology. Uh, none of those solutions look like a silicon wafer. So if you were able to move beyond the wafer format, you could imagine implementing bio-inspired designs in man-made systems. And in that category of device, we've been very interested in hemispherical uh, electronic eyeball cameras, flies eyes, things that adopt curvilinear shapes much different than the planar surface of a silicon uh, wafer. So I'll focus in this talk on bio-integrated, but a lot of the concepts are equal applicable to this bio-inspired uh, application space uh, as well. So the question is, how do you do this? Uh, how do you make a tissue-like piece uh, of electronics? There are a variety of uh, schemes that you can imagine. One would be to look at silicon and say, at least in the wafer form, it's never going to have those mechanics. Let's look at other materials. And so you can go to organic small molecules, polymers, graphene, carbon nanotubes, silicon nanowires, things like that. Uh, we have efforts in those spaces. A lot of other folks do uh, as well. I think there's a lot of promise there. On the other hand, if there's a way to use silicon uh, for these classes of applications, that's almost certainly the way that you'd want to do it because you would be building on a tremendous base of knowledge, a tremendous manufacturing infrastructure that's built up over the last half century of global efforts around silicon, uh, and that would accelerate the, uh, the, the maturation of, of, of the technology. And so uh, that's where our primary focus has been, is to try to think about how we can deploy silicon, monocrystalline semiconductor grade semi uh, silicon, into systems that offer those kinds of shapes and mechanics. So if you think about the silicon wafer, uh, it is certainly not well suited for those kinds of systems. Uh, that's partly because of the intrinsic properties of the silicon itself. It's a high modulus material, 150 gigapascals. Uh, it's not very uh, stretchy uh, in the sense that it breaks at about a 1% tensile strain. But some of those properties are a consequence of the geometry. And if you play with the geometry, you can uh, circumvent those, uh, those constraints. And so let me uh, describe you just a couple of very simple ideas in mechanics that allow you to make progress. So if you think about the wafer, it has a bending stiffness that's associated with the mechanical properties of the silicon itself, but also with the thickness of the wafer. It's about a millimeter thick. And simple elementary bending mechanics uh, dictates that the bending stiffness or the flexural rigidity decreases very rapidly in any material as you make it thin. So if you go from a silicon wafer, one millimeter thick, to a silicon nanomembrane, let's say 10 nanometers uh, in thickness, the bending stiffness decreases by many orders of magnitude due to a cubic dependence on the thickness. So if you think about a wafer, millimeter thick, its bending stiffness is about 10 newton meters. You go to a silicon nan nanomembrane, uh, its thickness is maybe you know, between one and 10 nanometers. 
uh, and its bending stiffness is, uh, you know, in the range of femtonewton meters. Uh, so save, saving many, many orders of magnitude just due to that elementary scaling law in, uh, in bending mechanics. The other benefit of thin is that the peak strains associated with bending to a given radius of curvature R decrease linearly with thickness. So not only does silicon become floppy and bendable, uh, it becomes uh, something that you can uh, bend into tight radius of curvature without fracturing the material, even at a 1% uh, fracture strain. So this is an image of a 20 nanometer thick sheet of silicon uh, created from a wafer-based source of the material illustrating that kind of bendability. Now the other uh, aspect of this is that although silicon in this format is very thin uh, and flexible, this is not a realistic uh, platform for an integrated circuit because it's also very mechanically fragile. If you touch this, it would shatter into a million pieces because it's, it's, uh, you know, it's very thin uh, and fragile as a result. Uh, so what you would want to do is take this kind of material and then mount it onto a substrate uh, that retains those kind of bending, uh, desired bend bending properties but uh, provides a, a level of physical tough, toughness that allow you to make, uh, make an integrated circuit for realistic application. So the way that you would do that then is you would heterogeneously integrate the silicon with a piece of plastic or a piece of rubber uh, to afford that kind of construct. Now if you think about that problem at a conventional chip scale where you're using a silicon wafer, that can be very difficult to do because when you bond silicon to a piece of plastic, changes in temperature drive interface stresses that tend to uh, open up cracks uh, between the uh, silicon and the underlying uh, plastic, and so that can be very difficult. On the other hand, when the silicon is in ultra-thin geometries uh, such as this, uh, the fracture mechanics uh, becomes favorable in the sense that the energy release rate, G, is proportional not only to the change in temperature squared, the difference in uh, coefficients in thermal expansion between the silicon and the plastic, for example, squared, but also linear in the thickness. So not only is silicon bendable and floppy uh, and flexible in these thin formats, it becomes easier and easier to heterogeneously integrate it with uh, dissimilar uh, materials as a result of this linear scaling in the uh, energy release rate. So for example, you can take a very thin piece of silicon, you can print it onto a sheet of plastic, in this case where we've micro-machined a ridge, and van der Waals horse forces are, alone are sufficiently strong to keep this thing uh, suspended in this cantilever geometry, partly because of this kind of scaling. So it becomes very easy to put silicon on plastic and you can make systems that are extremely bendable. How do you do that? How do you create the material in the first place? How do you manufacture with it? Those are two uh, challenges on the material science side that would need to be addressed to exploit this kind of mechanics scaling. So, um, you know, silicon wafer is created by sawing a boule. A uh, you can't saw silicon to a 10 nanometer uh, thickness or other kinds of uh, semiconductors you might want to use for, uh, for an application. But you can use uh, specialized growth techniques and etching approaches to create that form of material in ways that still exploit the wafer format and thin film growth techniques. So let me give you an example for the case of the compound semiconductor gallium arsenide, which is important for RF applications. You want to do optoelectronics. It's much more favorable than silicon due to uh, direct uh, band gap. So in this case, you take a gallium arsenide wafer and then you grow epitaxially, alternating stacks of high aluminum content gallium and aluminum arsenide uh, and gallium arsenide uh, itself in these kind of multi-layer configurations. If you do that and you etch down through the stack, immerse the entire thing in uh, hydrofluoric acid, the acid will etch the aluminum arsenide at a rate of about a factor of a million times faster than the gallium arsenide, thereby lifting off the surface of this underlying wafer multi-layer stacks of gallium arsenide nano membranes. Uh, and you can release material like that. Uh, the substrate is catalytic in this process, so you can refinish it and you can uh, regrow. And this becomes a very straightforward strategy to bulk quantities of this nanomembrane format in the semiconductor material itself. And you can think about it as an advanced implementation of epitaxial liftoff techniques originally developed by Eli Yablonovich back in the uh, 80s at uh, Belcor. Uh, but this approach is uh, attractive because it makes an extremely efficient utilization of the growth chambers because it eliminates cycles of load and unload that would otherwise be required in a single uh, layer uh, liftoff uh, approach. So this is what it looks like. This is a cross-sectional scanning electron micrograph of these stacks. Gallium arsenide, in this case, 200 nanometers thick. Aluminum arsenide, 20 nanometers thick. Those are the sacrificial layers. Etch down through that, immerse it in a, uh, HF. In this case, it's 40 layers. Uh, these gallium arsenide uh, membranes 
off the surface comes uh, a lot of very high quality semiconductor grade material. You can also do this in various uh, doped forms of gallium arsenide. So if you want uh, configurations set up for solar cells, uh, near infrared detectors, MESFETs, you can do that. Separate each of those layers with a sacrificial uh, uh, interlayer of aluminum arsenide and then you can release off the surface of the wafer sort of heterogeneous collections of materials for different device applications. This is what it looks like. Uh, you lift it off. It uh, ends up as a solution slurry in the etching bath. You can deposit it back down onto filter paper. Uh, and so as you can see, it's sort of bulk quantities of materials, in this case, configured for uh, mono, uh, single junction uh, solar cells. Uh, about 200 microns on the side, two uh, microns thick in this case. Uh, and so that becomes a realistic route to large quantities of materials in formats that allow you to exploit, exploit the mechanics I mentioned before. Now the next challenge, obviously, is this is not a photovoltaic module, for example. This is just a mess of material. How do you move it around? How do you manufacture with it? You might think you could come in with a robotic pick and place tool. Uh, that doesn't work because these materials are small enough and thin enough that it's very difficult to manipulate them using a, a straightforward uh, approach like that. So the question is, how do you uh, move, move them around and guide their deposition or deliver them down to desired locations on a substrate uh, of interest? And the way that we've done that is exploit the fact that because we're creating these things lithographically on a wafer host, uh, we know where the materials are when they're initially created. And you can exploit that knowledge in a kind of printing process in which the undercut etched uh, nanomembranes on the wafer almost act like an inking pad for a printing process is used as a soft elastomeric stamp with strategic features of relief embossed on its surface. So you bring it into contact with these undercut etched uh, nanomembranes tethered to the underlying wafer at strategic points using uh, breakaway photoresist anchors. You can lift this material onto the surface of the stamp and then print it down uh, onto a target substrate sheet of plastic piece of rubber at room temperature. And you can do that in a way that spreads the active material out from a dense aerial coverage on the wafer to a strategic coverage on the substrate of interest to match the application uh, that you're trying to build. And so you can do this in a step and repeat fashion, do area expansion, go from a small wafer to a very large uh, sheet of uh, plastic if you want to. So if you think about the material science associated with this manufacturing scheme, the, the name of the game is controlling the adhesion of these nanomembranes to the elastomer stamp. And particularly you want it to be strong enough so that you can ink the stamp up with these materials at very high yields. So you're pulling all of the nanomembranes that are in contact with the stamp off of the wafer host. But at the same time, you don't want the adhesion to be too strong because ultimately you have to get these materials off of the stamp and then down onto your target substrate. So the way that this works is you engineer the materials and the material structures in the stamp that allow you to switch the adhesion strength from very strong value during inking to a very weak value during printing. And there are a variety of ways to do that. You can exploit the viscoelasticity of the elastomer materials that you use for the stamp. You can do that in an optimized way. You can also control the relief feature so you can uh, modulate the adhesion strength by applied pressure. The variety of ways to do that. We've written many papers. I won't describe that. I just make the uh, point that this can work at a high level. You can build manufacturing tools around that simple concept that offer extremely high yields, four, five, nines, very good uh, overlay registration, uh, half micron, three sigma, and with high throughput. So about a million nanomembranes per hour, depending on the layout. Uh, and this is a tool that's used in a pilot line manufacturing facility for a type of uh, photovoltaic uh, technology that's being commercialized by a company in the RTP area. So uh, what does it look like then if you do this onto uh, plastic? This is an image of an array of gallium arsenide nanomembranes created by this epitaxial liftoff approach and then printed using this stamping technique onto a sheet of plastic in a planar geometry, subsequently we wrap it around the cylindrical surface of a curved glass substrate to illustrate the bendability of this system, uh, which is uh, notable because gallium arsenide is actually a lot uh, more mechanically fragile even than silicon, but the favorable mechanics of thin uh, prevent it from cracking and also prevent these uh, small islands from popping off of the uh, plastic as the temperature has changed or as you bend the system as illustrated here. So in this case, we have about 1,600 of these gallium arsenide nanomembranes printed onto plastic for this particular example is 100%. Uh, yield and in this step and repeat uh, mode. So the area coverage here is uh, very low compared to that on the source wafer. So if you imagine that as a starting point, 
uh, I'll make the argument to you that you can create very high quality devices. You have high quality semiconductor on plastic. You can use modified versions of otherwise you know, conventional processing techniques and materials to convert that material into high quality uh, devices. And you can do that in forms that are extremely bendable. Uh, and so this is an example uh, of a silicon CMOS test uh, array inverters on a sheet of uh, polyimide in this case where the entire thickness of the circuit is just a little bit larger than 1.5 microns. So silicon nanomembranes, uh, e-beam evaporated metal, low temperature PCVD oxide, uh, all patterned lithographically on this sheet of polyimide. The entire system is extremely bendable. Here it's shown wrapped around the sharp edge of a cover slip. That radius of curvature is about 30 microns. By virtue of thin, it's bendable, as I've mentioned a couple of times uh, already. Uh, you can be a little bit more sophisticated than that in the sense that you can choose the thickness of the polyimide substrate so that the neutral mechanical plane uh, is coincident with the most brittle materials in this system, which uh, is the silicon in this case. And so we do that as well to fully optimize the bendability. So you can do this if you measure the uh, DC and RF characteristics of silicon MOSFETs created in this way. You see mobilities on off ratios, uh, uh, cutoff frequencies that at least in our hands are very comparable to otherwise similarly designed devices we would build on an SOI wafer. So you have bendability, you have plastic substrate, you haven't given up anything in performance. And so that's the key feature of these kind of approaches is you get mechanics but you don't give up uh, electronic uh, functionality. So uh, that gets you to flexible. Now if you think about biology, it's more than flexible. You think about the heart, for example, as it moves, it's undergoing very complex deformations that involve not only bending, but also stretching, expansion, contraction, uh, stretching, and compressing. And if you wanted to wrap the heart with an integrated circuit, you would need a system that involves not only the ability to accommodate bending, but also stretching. And that's a totally different type of mechanics. Here, the peak strains in the materials are all less than 1% just because we made things uh, thin. If you took that same sheet and you start tried to stretch it, things would start to break at about 1% uh, extensional uh, strain. So this is not stretchable. Uh, but it turns out that you can get stretchable with just one more simple idea in mechanics. And that has to do with uh, engineered uh, buckling mechanics. So if you take this thin silicon, in this case, in this example, in the geometry of thin, narrow strips, and you bond it to a pre-strained piece of rubber, when you relax the pre-strain, compressive stresses are brought to bear on the silicon that induces a buckling instability that creates a wavy geometry, as illustrated here in this uh, angled view scanning electron micrograph. And in this geometry, the silicon is, a sim is simply an accordion bellows. So if you take the substrate, the rubber substrate, and you stretch it out, the amplitudes of these wave structures go down and the uh, wavelengths go up in a way that avoids strain in the silicon itself, but gives you an end-to-end -end stretchability in the overall composite system. And likewise, when you compress this thing, the amplitude go up, the, the wavelengths go down. So it's a perfectly linear elastic response to large strain deformations up to around 20, 30 percent. And I'll show you how you go higher than that uh, in a little bit. So if you think about this design strategy, you really need to understand all the details of the mechanics because you have to design the layouts to avoid fracture inducing strains in the silicon for the kind of uh, stretching levels that are required for a particular application. So a lot of the work around here, uh, this kind of technology involves not only device and circuit design from an electronic standpoint, but also mechanical engineering. So you get the layouts right, you get the buckles uh, in the places where they need to be to accommodate the applied uh, strain. So that's uh, the idea just implemented in a strip of silicon. Uh, that's not a device, not even integrated circuit. But the same concepts can be brought to bear on this neutral mechanical plane, thin uh, silicon CMOS. You do it chip scale. The whole thing buckles uh, when you relax, in this case, the biaxial pre-strain to create sort of a crumpled up circuit like this. Now the amplitudes of these wave structures are sort of modest, maybe a micron or two. The uh, wavelengths are maybe 100 microns, so the curvature is modest. But once you have these rippled features, you can stretch the circuit back and forth, and the substrate is providing the, providing the elastic restoring force to bring it back to its original geometry when the force is removed. Now the key thing, as I would mentioned before, in the flexible devices, that even in this uh, wavy geometry, the uh, intrinsic properties of the silicon MOSFETs are preserved because the strains at the active regions of the devices are still very small, much smaller than uh, 1%, so nowhere near fracture threshold. So if you measure the characteristics, they look like standard devices, although they're in a wavy shape on rubber. 
uh, giving you the mechanics that you want. And you can see that mechanics in an image like this. So this is one of these wavy integrated circuits pressed down in the middle with a glass pipette. Our uh, imaging folks at the Beckman Institute took this picture. And what it shows you is that these uh, uh, circuits now can accommodate curvilinear deformations and stretching in a way that the thin circuits uh, cannot. And that's critically important for integrating uh, with biology. So um, let me then shift. Those are the ideas in, in mechanics, materials, manufacturing that allow you to do some uh, maybe useful things with uh, silicon uh, integrated circuits. Uh, let me focus on what we've uh, tried to pick off in terms of biointegration and devices that provide uh, uh, useful levels of functionality. So in biointegrated devices, this community knows better than uh, any other, there is a very long history. People have been trying to put electrodes on tissues of the body for a century. Uh, and there are a lot of very powerful technologies that involve that integration uh, that are even FDA approved, as, as you guys know. Uh, and so if you look at what's out there, it's not a comprehensive list, but pa pacemaker, cochlear implant, deep brain stimulator, good examples, things that go on the skin as well. If you think about the architecture, though, take the deep brain stimulator used to treat certain forms of Parkinson's disease. It's basically electrode pads that integrate with the biology. The electronics does not. The electronics is separately located in a different box, and the integration is at uh, wire electrode ends uh, that uh, terminate at the electronics in a separate location. Uh, that's not a constraint for a lot of applications like this one, but if you wanted, instead of a few point contacts to the tissue, contacts at the level of the number of transistors that you could obtain using you know, advanced uh, silicon CMOS, millions, billions, uh, this is not going to be a viable way to do it. You simply can't handle that uh, number of wires. So this is very powerful, but it's not really what we're thinking about when we talk about bio-integrated electronics. This is bio-integrated electrodes. That's a little bit different. Uh, same thing with skin, uh, typically point contact electrodes, uh, cu uh, coupling gels, uh, and then separately located uh, data acquisition systems and electronics to, uh, uh, to read the data and interpret it. So uh, if you think about the brain, that might be a good place uh, to, to start if you want to integrate electronics with the body. Uh, this is an area we've had productive collaborations with the folks in uh, Epilepsy Center at U University of Pennsylvania. The notion is if you want to study the brain or you want to do therapy on the brain, brain is essentially an electronic system, it would be ideal if you could bring to bear to that problem man's most sophisticated uh, electrical systems, which are silicon CMOS integrated circuits. But you have a huge mismatch in geometry, also a huge mismatch in mechanics. I mentioned both of these things already. Silicon uh, modules about 150 gigapascal. Modules of brain tissues maybe five kilopascal. So a huge number of orders of uh, magnitude uh, separating those, those two materials, and that creates a challenge. So either you develop penetrating pins of silicon goes into the brain. If you want to do large areas, however, uh, uh, you uh, really have to move away from electronics, is essentially uh, what folks do, to the world of electrodes. So the particular clinical context that's been interesting for us is diagnostic systems that are used to map electrical activity in the brain in the context of surgical procedures used to treat the most acute forms of epilepsy, those that are non-responsive to drugs. And in that type of system, you laminate on the surface of the brain an array of passive electrodes, each one of which has an individual wire attached to an external data acquisition system, and you you map the electrical activity uh, during a seizure, and a trained surgeon can infer from that information which part of the brain is most uh, involved in that seizure, and through a resection, uh, that condition can be, uh, can be eliminated. Now, if you want to do that kind of procedure, you want the very highest spatial resolution, temporal resolution uh, that's possible, and scaling becomes very, very difficult if you continue to require individual uh, uh, wire contacts to these uh, electrodes, and so you can't go beyond a few tens uh, when, when you would ideally want to go to thousands or millions. And so that's the first uh, topic where we focus some of these ideas, is develop a high-resolution piece of electronics that could go on the brain, do this mapping at uh, extremely high levels of resolution to improve that uh, diagnostic technique used for this surgical procedure. So here's a, an example of the system that we built in that case. It's 288 sensors. I'll show you results from a device that has more like uh, 500. In this case, it incorporates two, a little over 2,000 of these silicon nanomembrane um, transistors in a geometry that provides active matrix addressing and local amplification. Active matrix addressing eliminates the need for a wire to each 
electrode pad, so you can do much higher density arrays. Local amplification improves the signal to noise by eliminating line noise from the measurement. So the electrode interface is just a thin film uh, metal pad. The entire system is sufficiently flexible that capillary forces associated with contact with the moist surface of the brain are sufficient to bring this system into good uh, conformal contact for low impedance measurement. So let me show you what this uh, looks like. Actually, back, back up. Here's uh, an animal model evaluation of this system. It's waterproof, by the way. It's another requirement of these devices. Laminated onto the surface of the brain of a cat uh, that is undergoing this, a very similar set of uh, procedures that I described for this uh, surgical technique used for humans that suffer from epilepsy. So you can put it on the brain of the cat. Uh, the cat is uh, awake in this experiment. You can apply neurotoxin to induce a seizure, and then you can use this kind of technology to map with unprecedented resolution uh, the electrical activity associated with that. So what I'm going to show you now is a movie. It's a color rendering of a voltage potential map on the surface of the brain of the cat uh, immediately after this neurotoxin is applied so you can see the behavior associated with uh, a seizure in this case. This is a temporal trace of a representative channel in this overall system uh, and this is time. So this is drastically slowed down compared to real time, one second, two second, three second. This first spike corresponds to the time when the drug is applied. You see a lot of abnormal electrical activity in the single channel in the full map uh, for about a second and a half after that period, but the seizure hasn't uh, ensued yet. That doesn't happen until this point. And what you can see is a very periodic time trace associated with that individual ch uh, channel and a corresponding spiral wave recurring instability in the uh, voltage uh, map measured with the uh, full piece of electronics. And so this is uh, providing value in the context, or potential value, in the context of this surgical procedure, but it also uh, can yield new insights into the neuroscience associated with uh, epilepsy. Uh, and there, again, we're uh, extremely fortunate to work with folks at Penn and also John Viventi uh, at NYU who are experts in epilepsy, and we're trying to uh, you know, use this kind of technology to help them uh, with their uh, research. So that's, uh, that's one example. You could do similar kinds of electrical mapping on the heart where the clinical context is in the treatment of certain classes of uh, arrhythmias. We got interested in um, the skin uh, because it has the potential for use outside of a clinical or hospital setting, uh, something that could get more broader, uh, broad level of adoption in the general uh, public. Uh, and so if you think about the skin, if you can do brain and heart, you might initially think skin would be easy. Uh, you, could, you could do that as well, using the same ideas. Skin turns out to be uh, harder, uh, however, because number one, it's generally not moist, so you can't exploit simple water capillary effects to keep the circuit adhered to the tissue. It has a surface roughness that creates a uh, demanding situation in terms of conformal contact. And it's heterogeneous in time and in mechanics through the depth of the system. In particular, it consists of a very hard layer of dead cells, the stratum corneum, and then a layer of different classes of cells which are constantly differentiating, migrating towards the surface of the system where uh, exfoliation uh, ultimately eliminates the cells uh, from the skin. It has the same challenges in low modulus, again compared to silicon, uh, that one faces with heart uh, and brain uh, and is typically fairly thin. So if you think about devices that interface with the skin, I'd mentioned already, primarily those are based on electrodes. That's fine for a clinical setting, but nobody likes to wear those uh, during daily life. So we took a step back and thought about, you know, what kind of technologies currently exist that do go on the skin in a non-invasive uh, sort of mechanically invisible way. And the obvious one is, uh, you know, a kid's temporary tattoo, some wonderful piece of materials technologies in a, in, in a lot of ways, because it goes on the skin. It's very, very thin, so it doesn't mechanically constrain the natural motions. As a result, you don't even know it's there. But it is uh, a piece of material that could potentially embed electronics. And so we got interested in that two, three years ago and decided to try to make 
uh, electronics in this kind of epidermal or kids tattoo format, which means ultra thin uh, in uh, thickness, maybe five microns is a good target that we set out early on, very lightweight to avoid mass loading, so maybe a milligram per centimeter squared, very low modulus, as low as you can go, certainly uh, at least matched to the skin, lower if possible. At the same time, the device needs to be air and water permeable to accommodate transpiration and waterproof to avoid uh, shorting of the active circuit elements through the skin into the underlying tissues. So that's kind of what we wanted to, wanted to do, and that's kind of some qualitative uh, considerations. Let me make a quantitative point associated with low modulus and small thickness as it relates to conformal contact and robustness of adhesion to the skin, because that's one challenge that's sort of plagued skin-mounted electronics over the years is that it tends to peel off and it constrains, it's irritating. So if you think about the mechanics of the system, you can do analytical modeling of what's, what's going on. So assume you have a piece of electronics, modulus E, thickness H, sitting on skin. Now let's assume the skin has a modulus of 5 kilopascals, maybe, maybe it's closer to 50, it depends on the animal and the human and the region of the body, but anyway, that, that's, that's a canonical number. Thickness of the skin of a millimeter. So think about then what happens at the interface between these two systems, this abiotic and this biotic system, when the skin is stretched or bent. Uh, and you can consider in this uh, framework different classes of electronics. So the simple one is silicon, 100 gigapascals, 300 microns. That's just gluing a chip to your skin. Uh, next level of sophistication would be flexible electronics. So maybe polyimid, 5 gigapascal, 50 microns. All the way to skin-like. This is the target I mentioned before. Tattoo-like, 5 kilopascals and 5 microns. And you can look at the shear stresses and the peeling stresses as a function of normalized distance along the edge. So the edge here corresponds to this position here. This is shear and peeling stress as a result of stretching the skin. So what you see is what you would expect. The interface stresses uh, peak up at the edge. Uh, that's where delamination typically will initiate. That's where the uh, fracture will happen. Uh, to begin with. You also see that the interface stresses reduce as you go from silicon to plastic to skin-like. Uh, and that also might be expected. The interesting thing is the magnitude. So think about the ratios of the uh, stresses uh, interfacially at this edge for the silicon chip compared to the plastic sheet for tension in the skin, 100% strain, and bending uh, to a radius of 3 millimeters. Um, the plastic sheet is better than the silicon chip, but not by that much, maybe a factor of five. So that's good, but it's not really changing qualitatively the way you think about design or uh, use of adhesives here. Uh, on the other hand, if you go to full E skin, all the way down to five kilopascals and five microns, now you're qualitatively changing the nature of the interface mechanics, and that can have a profound impact on the way you think about the integration. In particular, those ratios, in this case, uh, approach 10 to the fifth. And so that's a key uh, feature, a key motivation for making electronics in this format is adhesion gets really, really easy uh, onto the skin and you don't have to do uh, anything too crazy to keep it stuck. Now you can see this uh, in uh, si very simple experiments. Just take a piece of silicone rubber, same chemistry, change the cross-linking density to change the modulus, uh, and you can see what happens. So here's a typical piece of silicone rubber, uh, modulus of about two megapascal, mounted on the wrist. You bend your wrist and you see it starts to delaminate as a result of those compressive stresses. Likewise, if you stretch the skin, you see the delamination starting uh, at the ed edges. Take the same material, reduce the cross-linking density. Now you have a modulus more like 50 kilopascals. Uh, and suddenly, same material, same thickness sticks very nicely uh, to the skin, even when the skin is stretched dramatically or the wrist is bent. So same interfacial forces, just reduced stresses uh, to eliminate uh, delamination. Uh, and that's, that's uh, a very useful thing to think about. Now, you can do the theory. You can make the measurements. All that makes sense. Um, and I won't get into those, those details. But you're really managing fracture mechanics by managing the modulus of the material. Uh, for the system. So how do you get to 50 kilopascal? 
That's the trick because silicon has a modulus of 150 gigapascal. And the way you do it is you use ideas like those that I described before, very, very thin and exploit buckling mechanics. But you have to do it in a pretty sophisticated way in this case to get all the way into this epidermal mechanics. So what we do is we use a silicone rubber substrate, very thin, in this case 30 microns, formulated with a modulus of 50 kilopascals. And now instead of just a uniform circuit sheet, we use this ultra thin neutral mechanical plane system system etched into an open spider web type mesh of filamentary serpentine structures, which can support all kinds of devices. I'll show you and again uh, that uh, a little bit later. But this is the mechanical construct that allows you to achieve uh, epidermal type mechanics. And this doesn't happen by chance. We have collaborators who do full 3D finite element modeling of the mechanics. I mentioned that mechanical engineering is as important as electrical engineering in these systems. This is an example of that. If you do this, you can achieve stress strain curves in this hybrid, you know, mesh like electronics almost exactly the same as the skin. This is pig skin. 160 kilopascal, you stretch along X and Y, you see stress strain curves almost perfectly overlapping with the skin up to a strain of about 20%. At that point, the skin starts to behave uh, uh, inelastically. There's some, some damage there. Uh, and the measurements are consistent with the finite element modeling, so we uh, close the loop. So you can do very sophisticated auto, uh, optimization using these models uh, to get the kind of mechanics that, that you want to have uh, for the skin. So the filamentary serpentine geometry is for the mechanics. Devices, for the most part, don't care. These are pretty wide serpentines, state-of-the-art CMOS. You can put a lot of functionality even within the width of a single one of those traces. Here's an example of source drain and gate electrodes. The active channel region is at the intersection there. And then a silicon resistor for an amplifier for electrophysiological measurements. Here's an example of an integrated strain gauge. You can measure skin deformation or swelling in that way. Here's a silicon PN junction diode. You is that a photo detector or a solar cell, again, in that serpentine geometry. So really, the mechanics can be optimized almost independently of the devices. The devices don't care that much about geometries at this core scale, so you can achieve MOSFET characteristics that are very similar to the ones that you would uh, ordinarily see in a planar silicon wafer type geometry, but now you're skin-like. So this is what it looks like mounted onto the surface of the skin. Uh, filamentary layout, thin silicone substrate, laminated in this case on the surface of the skin of the postdoc who did the work. And we came in with a glass rod and poked him like this so you can see kind of how the skin uh, deforms and the circuit goes along with it. That's the key. It's not constraining the natural motions of the skin at all. Uh, and so it's non-irritating, it's mechanically invisible. Now if you grab this thing by the edge, you peel it off, you end up with something that looks like this. It's so thin and so mechanically soft and compliant, it's not self-supporting. So it just collapses on top of itself as you might expect. So the challenge, one of the challenges then is how do you manipulate the thing to mount it on the skin in the first place. And the way that we do that is we look back to the world of kids' temporary tattoos and we just use a water-soluble plastic sheet. As a temporary carrier for these devices, you can flip it over then, laminate it on the surface of the skin, wash the water-soluble polymer away, and then that constitutes the mounting process for this kind of uh, epidermal system. So I'll show you a movie uh, of how that uh, works. And you see it uh, laminated on skin. So here's uh, a device. It's placed face down, directly in contact with the skin. What you see back here is this transparent PVA polymer uh, that's being washed away uh, through application of a little bit of water with the, uh, uh, with the index finger. And as that polymer washes it away, it will leave just the epidermal electronics. Van der Waals adhered and in conformal contact with the skin. Uh, in a way that by this kind of modulus engineering, uh, the interface mechanics uh, are robust enough to accommodate deformations of the skin, as you'll see in a second. So this is a device that serves as a platform uh, of various components for electronics. It doesn't have a higher level of functionality, but it does have working silicon MOSFETs, RF diodes, inductors, capacitors, LC oscillators, strain gauges, temperature gauges, RF inductive coil, and an RF antenna all embedded uh, within it. So you'll see now the mechanics that I'm talking about. So this is the device. This shiny boundary here, that corresponds to the perimeter of the silicone, uh, soft silicone support. That silicone sheet is now facing out. So it's providing environmental uh, protection. The circuit is sandwiched between that sheet and the skin. So the circuit is in direct contact with the skin, allowing measurements of electrophysiological signals, which I'll mention in a second. So as you can see, as you pinch and squeeze and stretch the skin, 
it moves in a natural way. If you look at the nature of the wrinkles and how the skin is deforming, it deforms almost exactly the same in areas where the skin uh, circuit is not as uh, in the areas where the circuit is located. And it's by virtue of that mechanical engineering of the layout that that happens. Now the absolute value of the adhesion is modest. It's really by uh, managing interfacial stresses that we uh, achieve robust bonding. That uh, allows then the circuit to be peeled away. If you grab it from an edge, you can peel it off. Uh, it's just Van der Waals uh, adhered. And by doing so, you can get a sense of the mechanics of the uh, device and a, uh, a better idea of what it, what it looks like. Uh, so that's, that's the system. Now, if you want better adhesion, you can add an adhesive. Uh, and we figured why not just use ones that are already available in commercial tattoos. They're already approved for use. You can just mount your epidermal electronics on the backside of a tattoo. Uh, and then laminate that onto the skin. Much more robust adhesion, you still have the favorable properties of integration because the tattoo itself has the right mechanics and your circuit is not modifying that. Uh, so this is a simple tattoo uh, just to demonstrate. Uh, and the circuit in this case is sort of in the facial region uh, of the pirate uh, in this system. You can't see it because you can't look through the tattoo. So you want to conceal your skin electronics. This is one way to do that. So not only is it mechanically adhered to the skin, but from an electrical standpoint, you have good interface because the system is conformal to the roughness of the skin. This is an SEM image of one of these kinds of devices on a polymer skin replica uh, created from molding against uh, human skin. And you can see uh, how this device conforms uh, almost all regions except the most extreme ones. Uh, with the surface topology uh, of the skin. Uh, and that's important if you want to do electrical measurements uh, through the skin, uh, for example. So I have one of these devices mounted on my skin uh, right now, and I have a um, USB microscope. Uh, I'll give you a sense of what this looks like. If you want to come up after the talk, I'd be happy to show you uh, these devices. I'll show you the ones that are mounted on my skin, uh, my forearm at least. Uh, and so this is um, just a microscope. So this is skin, just bare skin. Here, let me focus this thing. So the skin, obviously, it's very rough. This is um, a region where the circuit is located, here. Uh, so these will last about two weeks. Uh, you can go swimming, you can uh, take a shower, it's not, not a problem. Uh, it's very mechanically robust. Again, if you're interested, you can come, come up and take a look. Um, this is sort of Gen 1 uh, of these devices. You can see the wiring is fairly coarse. Uh, the Moore's Law equivalent scaling in this kind of technology is to make the serpentines narrower and thinner because you get better mechanics that way. So this is a little bit more uh, aggressive. You can see uh, sort of scaling down uh, of the dimensions and the benefits in the associated mechanics uh, without any uh, negative consequence on, on, on robustness of, uh, of adhesion and wearability. So the question is, what do you do with this uh, technology? Um, you know, you could do, put your cell phone on your skin. That's not that interesting. The ability to measure body processes is probably more uh, more exciting. And so this provides a dry uh, electrode for measuring high quality EP signals from ECG to EMG and EEG. This is EEG measured on the chest. This is EMG measured on the leg during walking and then standing. If you compare the uh, contact impedances and the signal levels to conventional paste on electrodes with conductive gels, the signal to noise and the signal amplitudes are about the same. The advantage of this is you get rid of the gels, you have a format that's uh, completely uh, invisible to the user, and you have a platform for doing full electronics integration rather than just uh, electrodes. So the signals are about the same, but uh, it's a different format with more powerful capabilities. We work with Todd Coleman uh, as well on this stuff, and so you can do EEG measurements, you can see alpha rhythms, you can see Stroop effects, all the expected stuff, uh, even for signals like EEG that, are, uh, that can be challenging to detect. These systems uh, can accommodate that. The other thing you can do is you can mount these uh, devices on parts of the body where you really couldn't accommodate a wire and a uh, piece of tape. So for example, think about the neck. The neck is interesting because there's a lot of fine muscle control uh, in the neck region associated with speech. And so we work with uh, Todd Coleman. You put these things on the neck, and then you can monitor EMG. So this is spectral information. This is time, frequency, it's power spectra, it's a function of time, essentially. As the person wearing the device is saying different words, either vocally or subvocally. So stop, go, you see different patterns here. Todd is very good with uh, signal processing, so he can develop learning algorithms that can take data sets like this and convert the EMG 
patterns, bend them into a finite vocabulary of words. And so that becomes an interesting technology for people who suffer from diseases of the throat uh, and the trachea, maybe also uh, systems for doing prosthetic control. Uh, as an initial demonstration, we showed that you could play a video game, very simple strategic one, in which you're using your neck to move a cursor up, down, left, or right. Uh, and so if you're interested in playing video games with your neck, uh, we have the technology to do that. Um, this is sort of a, a, a toy demo. We've been working with uh, folks at the Beckman Institute, Doug Jones and Tim Brettel. The system's a little bit more sophisticated now. It has real-time capabilities. And so what we're doing here with those guys is using epidermal electronics on the forearm to control a helicopter in this case. So this is the guy uh, doing the control, a sort of bimanual control. So it's on the uh, forearm uh, and then there's a set of commands. He's rotating his wrist like this. That causes the helicopter to launch. Uh, he'll angle his wrist like this. That will cause the helicopter to rotate. He'll stop that in a second uh, and then he'll uh, issue a command for the, for the uh, helicopter to move, move forward. In, th in that case he's just squeezing, clenching his fists uh, and then rotate it, uh, move it back down, rotate it uh, to cause it to elevate again. And what he's trying to do is get it to come back and land back in this box where it started from. So as you'll see, he gets close, moving, moving like this. Uh, the thing will rotate and then clinch the fists again and it will fly back. And as you'll see, this is very early stuff. It's not, not published. He gets close, but not, not quite back into the box. So he needs a little bit more training. But anyway, yeah, that, gives you a sense of what, what would be possible. So um, let me just stop there then and uh, mention and acknowledge uh, some of the senior collaborators ranging from academic folks, the Beckman guys I just mentioned, Yang Gong Huang on the theory of the mechanics, Placid Ferrer on the manufacturing systems, Todd Coleman on EEG and interface, uh, uh, Ralph Nuzzo on materials and chemistry, and then a lot of these uh, efforts are directed to clinical realistic applications rather than research tools, and so we work with a lot of uh, physicians uh, in neurology, cardiology, and rehabilitation. Um, so finally, let me acknowledge all the students and, and postdocs in the group. They're the ones who do all the work, come up with a lot of the best ideas. I just get to talk about it. So uh, I'll conclude by acknowledging them and, and thanking you for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Time for one or two questions. Please come up and use the uh, microphones. Uh, so this is really fascinating. Uh, the one thing that came to mind, though, is if you're looking at chronic implants, the packaging becomes a real critical part. And it seems that most of the materials that would be thin and flexible also tend to be water permeable over time. So. Have you given any thought what to do about packaging for chronic implants? Yeah, I think chronic implants are uh, an area that will require some additional work. We've, we've focused mo mostly on devices that go on the skin maybe a week or two weeks or surgical tools that are uh, resident on the uh, organs for a limited amount of time, few hours. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, things that go in the body for years, for example, will require some additional work on, on packaging and, and materials. So I think you're making a very, very good point. Uh, that's a topic of current work for us. I don't have a, a solution that I can throw out uh, at this moment. Uh, so we're interested in it in the future, but at the same time we think there's lots of compelling applications in surgical tools, health and wellness monitors, things that don't require long-term integration uh, with, with the body. So I think there are a lot of opportunities to come up with, with good ideas ar around packaging and, and water barriers in, in this kind of format. We actually grappled with it in the context of devices for, for the heart brain as well because you're flushing the devices with warm uh, saline to keep the tissue moist during these uh, open surgical procedures and even there is extremely challenging we spent a long time trying to get the packaging robust enough so that we could uh, accommodate even just hours uh, of uh, contact and immersion in, in saline so I think you're highlighting a very important challenge one that will require additional work we think we've solved the problems in the context of the applications I'm talking about now, but we haven't solved, solved all of the problems for all of the applications. Yeah. Thank you for the great presentation. My question may be a, a follow-up of the previous one. Uh, the current implant electronic device all have a battery which takes most of the volume. 
So I wonder in this flexible circuitry, have you considered the, the battery technology? Is there going to be a flexible battery? Yeah. Yeah, so we haven't published it. We have stretchable batteries. I mean, you just use the same concepts. You can uh, segment a battery into small islands. You use uh, strategic interconnects between them. Uh, and you can achieve an effective stretchability or uh, compliant mechanics, even though the individual battery components are uh, rigid, just, just like the silicon. So a lot of the same kind of mechanics concepts. So we have batteries in small patches that you can stretch out to three, 400 percent strain uh, biaxially. Uh, so you can do that. I would argue that in a lot of applications, though, you might not even need a battery. We're interested in it. We're, we're working on it. I think many applications will require, but, it, but a lot of them can do near-field coupling or far-field uh, RF uh, powering. Uh, we've done that with surface-mounted uh, LEDs. I don't know if I have an example uh, somewhere in this presentation. Anyway, we've done, done a lot of work on um, um, wireless uh, trans transmission of power. Certain cases, maybe solar would be, be viable. Depends on exactly what you're doing. Uh, and we can put, put solar cells into these platforms as well. So power and communications. I mean, th those are two areas of technology where, uh, you know, I think, again, there are a lot of opportunities for work as in, in, in encapsulation. We're working on some of the problems, but, but not all of them. So, you know, in general, I think this, this technology, there's some important applications that can be addressed now. But in a broader sense, this is a start, not a finish. So I think there are a lot, a lot of additional things that could be, could be explored. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, you talked about uh, RF applications and you talked about having an inductor on uh, one of the yeah. tattoos. Yeah. It looks like the whole thing is an inductor, all the curves and the... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just wondering if you're doing anything with doing multiple layers or yeah. whether that, whether the curves actually, the inductance in the curves are have any effect on the yeah it's really really an interesting question so we've uh, looked at that it depends on the uh, connectivity of the system obviously the uh, the inductance and exactly how you lay out these uh, serpentine wires so for example you can really do some interesting things using fractal layouts because that changes the uh, the inductance dramatically so um, we've looked at that we've thought about it we haven't done absolutely everything that you might imagine, but I think it's a very good point. Let's see if I can find, uh, unfortunately, don't. I, if you're interested, I'll show you some uh, wireless LEDs that can be implanted subdermally, and they use uh, inductive coils uh, for, for power. You know, there are other things that you can do that, you know, don't even really require uh, power, so you can just do inductive impedance measurements of uh, hydration. So you can you can make coils that look look like this, and you can uh, you can probe the uh, scattering parameters in this way, and calibrate the data against a conventional moisture meter. So do skin level hydration measuring uh, uh, functionality in that way, uh, without without any power on board. These are all all very good questions. I think uh, that concludes our session. I know a couple more of you have uh, questions, and hopefully you can speak with Professor Rogers afterwards.